So with that, uh, I'll hand it off to Catherine and uh, I'll stop sharing so you can, you can show up. I'll leave this up just for a second so people can see your background. Um, but uh, she's a graduate of David Payne's group, uh, obviously one of the premier fiber optics group uh, laser, laser groups in, in, the, in the world. And she's worked at Finisar, JDS, New Focus, now at Facebook, um, where she's sourcing director for A6 and custom silicon. So she's a fellow of the OSA and uh, very active in OFC and, and many other conferences. So with that, Catherine, I'll hand it off to you. You're muted right now. You're still muted, Catherine. Still muted. There you go. <laughs> okay. I went into presentation mode. Okay, so can yes, you, can, you see. can see, right? Um, so thank you very much for the introduction, John. And um, I'm looking forward to the to the discussion today and to tell you a little bit about some of the challenges in uh, data centers that pertain to energy efficiency and our future needs. So um let me go ahead there <laughs> um so this is a view inside one of our data centers and i thought i'd start by showing some of the things that happen inside a data center some of the functions uh, so obviously there's a large compute function there's um a lot of data this is all the <laughs> if you are active on facebook or messenger or whatsapp or instagram or any of our, our applications um you know there's a lot of pictures videos uh chat that needs to be stored so storage is a large part of the infrastructure inside a data center as we do that compute function um we need memory obviously to um to be able to manipulate that data just to be able to get it to the right place at the right time and do backups and that kind of thing um and then um one of the largest growing areas of our data center infrastructure at the moment is is um ai ml and video transcoding this is so that we have um just to describe what that really means so um video transcoding is needed so that no matter what device you're using no matter what your internet connection bandwidth is you're able to have a fluid experience using the apps so that the videos and other multimedia you're using is at the appropriate resolution and takes a reasonable time to download and all of that as you can imagine is incredibly complicated and um we have been investing heavily in that area. Again, in AIML, um, a, a lot of the way that these applications work requires us to, well, first of all, for security reasons, that there's a, we, we need to know um, to protect people and make sure that we're, we're not putting inappropriate things out there. So that requires some, some AI. Um, and then you can imagine ranking and recommendation, which is a lot of how the platform works, is a very big user of AIML. So that's what's happening in the data center. It's all connected together with the network. <laughs> and that's gonna be um, the topic in the afternoon where we talk about photonics because our network is largely a photonics network um, and um, opportunities for energy efficiency there. Yeah, so um, moving on. <laughs> um, so I did touch on AIML as one of the largest growing areas in our infrastructure. And uh, this chart is, is from the literature. This is um, some data that was collected um, by the group in Berkeley. And it's it's just interesting to, to see how fast this is growing and it's it's representative you're going to see some more detail um, as we go through the talks today I know I'm not the only one um, hitting this point but I'll I I like this chart because it includes Moore's law and um, I think we're all very familiar with Moore's law and the journey we've been on um you know factors of two in two years it's it seemed like a, a, a really 
a really good journey. And then it just is dwarfed by the growth that's going on. If we look at computer vision um, and natural language processing, speech, that's the blue line, and that's on a, approximately 50 times growth every two years in terms of the model size and complexity. Um, but I think the one that catches everyone's attention is this more recent trend, and it's in red here for good reason. This rings alarm bells, lots of places. Um, phenomenal growth, 750 times in two years. Um, it's just hard to comp comprehend that. So this is the, the Transformers, um, deep learning. Uh, it, it, as I said, we'll get into more of this as we go through the session this morning. I think that's going to be a very interesting discussion. So Meta is just at the beginning of our journey. So I showed some very large growth rates. If you look at this chart, this is just our inference, which is a which is small compared to training. Um, and we're really just getting started. So here, and this looks very modest, right? Two or three times growth over two years. This is old data. That's the first thing to say. <laughs> and so as with all hockey, here. So what is, um, why, why, what, right? How does this touch the infrastructure? I thought I'd start by just going through training um, and the process that training follows. So we start with data and obviously there's a lot of data in our data centers. You need a lot of data to make the model um, that you, you the quality of your results depends on the amount of data you use. So it all starts with data and then a set of features. This is defining what the model is going to do and the boundary conditions set up around that that model. The model is then trained. And then the results are evaluated and there's a feedback loop here. This is, this is um, one of the feedback loops that needs to be accelerated. This is something we call developer velocity, and it's the speed at which you can iterate through your models. So um, this is very, this is an important loop. And then um, as the model goes through that development and then it gets deployed, obviously there's multiple generations of this. So there's a, um, an infrastructure loop. So we can think of this as a software loop and a hardware loop. And um, that's an important point because it leads to, um, you know, how do you keep up with these tremendous rates of growth? And it's by using these two loops efficiently together. This is hardware, software, co-design. I'm seeing thumbs up. So I, I, I think I'm having some internet issues. I'm just gonna keep going. So it's working at the moment. Um, so some of the strains that this accelerated innovation puts on our infrastructure um, is illustrated here in the purple boxes and the purple lines. There's, there's, there's a challenge with storage just because there's so much data that needs to be stored and it needs to be connected to the features. There's a challenge in the network because that's a lot of bandwidth that needs to be moved around. And there's a challenge in the computer memory because it's a lot of data that's being computed, a lot of memory that, that needs to be accessed and latency requirements to make that go fast. So speed of innovation is key here. And um, I said already, software, hardware co-design is really how we get ahead of this. Um, so let me talk about another area where we're able to, um, to move fast and it's a dimension of flexibility. And um, 
we get flexibility by breaking the problem down and configuring it in different ways. So this is an example of how we do that in hardware. So this is the hardware design. Um, we're, we're already seeing disaggregation, so breaking a problem down in, uh, in logic, uh, in compute logic. We've already, uh, the industry has already been doing multiple cores and breaking down um, large chips into smaller pieces in that environment where everything is the same, just more pieces. We're now looking at um, another level of flexibility where it's functionality. So we're, we're choosing which chips or chiplets are done on particular nodes and that adds more flexibility. So you'll see the, the colored blocks change shape as they are um, implemented on different hardware solutions, different semiconductor solutions. And there's examples in the industry that we can point to where this saves cost by improving yield. This is a particular example from AMD uh, where the, the chips are getting so large that yield impacts cost. If you build a very large chip, um, yielding that full chip, that full die, um, becomes difficult because the, the, the defect density becomes an issue. So if you can um, partition that large chip, create chiplets, as you see shown here, um, the defect density um, means that there's less defects per chip. And so that helps with the yield. Um, again, there's, there's a number of these different examples. This is happening in the industry already, but it's something that we can leverage here. So um, I'm pointing to this afternoon session uh, with optical interconnect as an example to, to build on from here, where once you're using chiplets because of all the, you know, the flexibility and the improved yield and the um, ability to scale faster, um, how do you put those chiplets back together? How do you connect them together again? And this is an opportunity for uh, photonics because these are high bandwidth interconnects and as, as we move up in bandwidth it becomes more power efficient at, at some point to, to use photonics and we'll talk more, more about what that point is I'm sure that'll be an interesting discussion. Um, so here's some examples, uh, the left hand side this is some examples in the network how you could use optical interconnects in the network to connect things together and uh, I'm sure we'll be talking more about that today in this, in this afternoon session. And compute I.O., the, um, the computational um, systems have very high bandwidth connections too, and there's opportun opportunities to use photonics there. So that will be very interesting. Um, why I point to network, I think we have some, some interesting data here which indicates why this is an an area to focus on, particularly because of energy efficiency and, and reducing power consumption. The chart on the left, um, you, you can see how despite our best efforts to reduce the power per, per, per unit bandwidth over time, just the amount of bandwidth that the network needs is increasing exponentially. So of course those two don't, don't offset each other. So we're looking at a net positive increase in power, which is obviously not desired. And um, this, this we see over generations in our data center. If I build this out, oops, too far. If I build this out here, we see, <laughs> sorry, there's some lag, here we go. Um, we see that not that long ago, 2012, the network uh, in terms of power percentage power didn't show up as a considerable usage. And that has significantly increased. And where it's in, the rate at which it's, it's increasing is alarming. So this is something that we need to do, do, do something about for the reason is because of the chart on the left. Um, we will talk more about that for sure. And um, one way, that we're looking at solving 
part of that power problem is through integration. And this is an evolution of optical interconnect as we see the path forward, moving from pluggable optics through inboard, uh, midboard optics to co-packaged optics. And you can see the level of increase uh, of the level of integration increases at every generation to the point where we can actually have, we can re remove a lot of the energy that gets wasted in interfaces by having a very compact solution. And this is work that we started a couple of years ago and you can find out more about it at the co-packaged optics um, link that's listed here. So I, I'd like to leave some time for questions. So I'll summarize here. Um, some of the areas that would be useful to collaborate further on. The first one is design for high volume. Uh, this is something that all the hyperscale data center users have in common. It's, it is a very high volume and I'm talking about unit volume and scale things. I, it's a, it's a lot of pieces and it's growing fast and that's common to all of the hyperscalers. So uh, designing for that environment is very important. There's a lot of leverage to be had there. Um, to reduce power through chiplet integration. I think that um, the evolution that I just showed is a piece of the solution and I'd like to enc encourage collaboration to build the ecosystem. Uh, there's a lot of different moving parts and pieces of the puzzle. And if we work together, I think we can create a very strong solution. So that's all I had in my talk. I look forward to some questions and I've shared my contact information here as well. Uh, so, and I'm available for follow up afterwards. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, any questions from panelists or on the chat? There is one in the chat too, John, when you, when you get to it. Okay, from Johannes, are there any approximations or estimates about the share of AI ML related to overall compute? Um, I don't have specifics to share on that, but as we get into the discussion, um, there's going to be a panel on AM, AIML, and that might be an opportunity to dig another layer into that. I'm going to stop sharing so I can see people. Okay. <laughs> well, the demand you showed is indeed very scary. I don't know if that was your second slide, roughly, but uh, uh, the need for this is huge. How? How big of impact can we have? If everything, you know, all the disaggregation and all the optical interconnects and all the improvements and learning happen, um, do you think the share of electricity going to data centers will, will remain constant or go down? Or do you see it continuing to increase? I, I, I'm a realist. I, I think that's an ambitious goal. But um, the, the trend, if we just extrapolate from where we are today, of course, that's completely unsustainable. So th there's two extremes there. <laughs> um, I think it, the goal is clear, the target is clear. How close we get, I wouldn't like to say. <laughs> okay. Uh, so there were, there were a couple questions in the chat. Why don't you go ahead and read them? I don't see anything else. So so from Neil Anderson, uh, in current state-of-the-art data centers, what, what fraction of the total consumed energy is consumed at the chip level for compute, compute plus memory? I mean, how do you expect this fraction to change going forward? Oh, that's such an interesting question. It's one of those questions where it sounds so simple, doesn't it? <laughs> like we must have a metric for that. Um, and I'm trying to slice through a number of different areas in our data center to try and get to that sort of nice rule of thumb. And what I'm coming to is it's, unfortunately, it's all very complex. Um, I don't have a good handy rule of thumb that I can pull out to, 
to answer that question, but I, th I think it, I'm enjoying the question. <laughs> and I think that would actually be very useful for, for some of the collaboration discussions. So um, thank you. <laughs> One of the questions was about, will your shy slides be shared later? I'll just make a global answer first, which is uh, if the speakers are willing, then we will post the slides. And again, I think most speakers have agreed, but so this is workshop is being recorded and we'll put the presentations out on UCTV. Uh, again, as encouragement, all the panelists will allow us to do that. We typically find like the last workshop, the, you know, the, downloads from UCTA TV end up being tens of thousands and even more than that in, in, in a couple of cases. So it gets a much broader impact at that point. So, um, and Catherine, so I don't know if you're willing to share these slides. Uh, that was the question was directed to you. So I'll, I'll pass that on. Um, so the first thing is uh, indirectly, the slides are shared, the session is recorded. So, <laughs> the, so the slides are there. Um, Sending them, I, I, I'm going to see what format I can um, share them externally. That's usually where we have challenges. But for sure, they're available if you rerun the session. Great. Thank you. Other questions? OK, we can move on. Do you want to introduce Bharat? I'd love to. Yes.